What would you say was the most challenging aspect of that kind mm -hmm. of a life, being a, being a reality star from a young age? Yeah, probably one of the hardest things was whenever you walk through challenges and trials, and it's also public. You can be in that place where everybody's praising you one day, and then the next day they're all hating you, and it reminds you just how dependent you are on the Lord. What inspired you to write Becoming Free Indeed? The harmful teachings of Bill Gothard, it needed to be exposed. And I wanted to be able to help people who are still stuck in these teachings. Did you wrestle with what to share and what not to mm -hmm. share? Was there times where you're like, this is too personal? Mm -hmm. Ginger Volo, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. So you are, some people know your background. Some people may be just learning it. Mm -hmm. You were a star of the hit reality, multiple hit reality TV shows. And then you recently wrote a book, Becoming Free Indeed. I'm excited to dive into all of it because your story is so powerful. So let's just start with who is Ginger? Tell us about your background. Yeah, so I am probably most well known from growing up in the Duggar family. I'm one of 19 kids. I'm number six of the kids. And we grew up in the public eye. Um, and we were on TV from the age, I was on TV from the age of like 10 all the way up until 27. And so just like three and a half years ago, when the show ended, um, we had been filming all of that time, a reality show. So it's kind of a crazy, crazy upbringing. Um, a lot of fun though. My parents, um, pointed us to Jesus. Like they were such, um, firm, like devout believers. And so I was really thankful to like have a foundation of faith and my family was very close knit. And so I was really grateful for that foundation that they laid for us, um, from an early age. And you just wrote a best-selling book. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I just wrote a book. It's called Becoming Free Indeed. Mm -hmm. And it is my journey of disentangling faith from fear. And so I was raised in a setting where I followed a teacher, Bill Gothard, who basically claimed to speak for God, but he didn't. And he taught a lot of um, legalistic rules, things that I would look back now and say were kind of cult-like. Mm -hmm as teachings that I thought were the Bible for so many years. But then looking back and comparing that with the word of God, I realized, wow, like that's not what it was. It was not the Bible at all. It was just man-made teachings. So I'd love to start with the reality TV show upbringing. And I know that, you know, you have such close rapport from what I can see with so many of your mm -hmm. 19 or 18 yeah. siblings, yeah. but what was it like growing up on reality TV? It was so much fun, really. I have so many awesome memories of traveling with my family. I think mm -hmm. that my parents always sought to like make the best of whatever trips we would go on before the show started. Um, but it was also really challenging with that many kids. It was tough to be able to travel all the time or to um, get out and see sites and stuff. And so once the show started, it was really cool because it kind of kickstarted for our family, this awesome adventure that we could go on, um, learning together, going together, traveling across um, the United States and then also outside of the country. And so we basically with the show, they would come in, it was like three to five days a week and every week of the year, every huh? week, wow. pretty much. I mean, there were a couple times, a there were some times where they would take like little breaks, but I mean, I, it didn't really feel like it. I don't know. Like, cause we were so used to them being there. So like, I wouldn't film every single day because I had so many siblings. So maybe like one day they would follow me to like a photography shoot or something. And then the next day they would go with Joe to fix a car. And so they would kind of just like jump around. And then another day we'd do interviews for like three hours. And so it was just the life that we knew growing up. And so the reality side of it was like, for us, we would feel like the crew. They were like our best friends and they were just hanging out with us, um, just filming what we were doing in everyday life. And so it seemed very normal because that's basically what I knew from the age of 10 all the way up. And so whenever like you step outside of that, it's like, wait, that was kind of crazy. Like that was a unique, sweet season, um, but it was a little wild. Your parents, uh, from what I understand, they were very, like this was done with a lot of intentionality in terms mm -hmm. of their decision to, I mean, have 19 kids, their decision to do reality TV with their young children. I mean, your, mo your mother was having mm -hmm. babies while this filming was happening. What went into their decision-making that you know of, or how did they, better question would be, how did they communicate that to you kids? Like yeah. why the crew was there so often? 
Yeah, I think that it was interesting because we grew up um, having been in the Bill Gothard system. We didn't have cable TV in our house. So being on TV and not having TV in our house was kind of like a little confusing for a lot of people. Like, why would you do this? Why would you put your family on TV when you won't even watch it yourself? And so my parents, I remember when they were first approached by the TV crew, um, it was first started out as like a documentary. So there were about like, I think three or four one hour documentaries that mm -hmm. Discovery Health did on my family. And my parents before that, they had prayed about it and they were like, I just, you know, we want this to not um, be like a distraction for our family. We want uh, all of our kids to like think about this as a ministry and as like pointing people to Jesus. And so that was like their main heart and focus as to why they wanted and they to do tell the show. Kids that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then um, that kind of just basically as, as the show went on, they were very good about like sitting down with us and just saying, don't let this get to your head because the older you got, you realize like people are stopping my mom everywhere. Mm -hmm. She can't go anywhere in the grocery mm -hmm. store. It's crazy. Like anytime we travel, you're getting stopped because it's like, it's just, you know, our family is so unique. So we kind of stand out and they just would always kind of keep us grounded just to have a conversation in the why behind why we were doing the show. Um, and that was so helpful and foundational because I feel like without that, there are so many, um, even like child celebrities who like get in the spotlight, but they're doing it alone. They're not mm -hmm. able to be in a place where they're able to talk about it. Even as a family, you're not experiencing the same things. Cause it's like one child's pulled out of that. And so I was thankful that it wasn't like that, mm -hmm. that it was like a family thing that we did because a lot of that really, it, it kind of bonds you in a different way because you have this life experience that maybe I feel like hardly anybody else could understand that's around you in your community. Um, and so, yeah, it was an interesting, interesting process, but I feel like they did such a good job walking us through it as kids. Did you feel growing up because I'm owning mean, tenure when you're a 10 year old girl, you're about to hit puberty. It's a very mm. personal time, quite frankly. I mean, your mom, of course, is having her own personal time, having children. So these are really intimate moments. Did you feel that you were able to express, there was a space for you to express your boundaries and your feelings about the process and, in a, and it was done in a way that you felt protected or were there times when you're like, this, this felt off for you growing up? Yeah, I didn't really think too much about it. I think I was so young. It just all seemed so normal. And there would be, you know, a time or two where maybe the crew would come into the girls' room because we had like one big girls' room, one big boys' room. And they would like come in and maybe I was still in bed and I was like a little embarrassed. So I'd just get under the covers or like wait till they moved. Or they'd say, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know somebody was mm -hmm. still sleeping. And then I'd like run and go get ready, you know? So there were a couple of times that like something like that happened. But for the most part, I think it was, it actually like, so improved our quality of life in many ways um, that the show provided more for our family than we had ever had. And so I think that a lot of us, like, I can't speak for all my siblings, but I mean, a lot of us really looked at it as like such a positive thing. And it like gave us opportunities that we never would have had otherwise. So what, what was one of the like most memorable and fun things that you got to be a part of or do because of the reality show growing up? It's a great question. I had to think through like all the years. Um, I think really like the travels that we went on, we got to travel overseas a lot. All um, nine, eventually 19 of you, yeah, 19 tickets. All of us. And then even <laughs> some of the married siblings and their mm -hmm. kids would travel together. My grandma would come with us on a lot of those trips. She always wanted to go to Israel, but never could make it over there. And it was really cool because she was able to take a trip with us over there to Israel. And it was like a dream for her. Wow. She was just thinking, wow, like how could I be here? You know, we were all able to experience it together. And I think that was such a memorable trip. She's since um, passed away and it's just amazing. Like looking back mm -hmm. at that, cause it like growing up in such, you know, a large family, there are also things you have to sacrifice. You can't just fly everybody across the country because it's so expensive. And so the show provided that. And so the travels are something that I definitely um, will look back at that as like my most fond memory is just traveling as a family. I love that. Israel is so special. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's so much prayer that that whole region needs right yeah, now. Um, for sure. What, is, what would you say was the most challenging aspect of that kind mm -hmm. of a life 
being a, being a reality star from a young age? Yeah, I think probably one of the hardest things was um, just like the negative sides that come with it whenever you walk through challenges and trials and it's also public. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's something that it really um, humbles you and it reminds you uh, just how dependent you are on the Lord and it gets you on your face before him because I think that you can be in that place where everybody's praising you one day and then the next day they're all hating you. And I think that it really jolts you and you see like, I don't want my identity to be found in like being on reality TV or being over here. I want it to be found in who I am in Christ and what he thinks about me and not about what other people think. And so I think the negative sides, definitely negative comments as anybody who is on social media at all knows. I think so many people who now they will have the same idea and like they'll get that same taste of what it's like to be in a public place just because mm -hmm. of, you know, Instagram or wherever they are online, you'll have those really harsh negative comments that will come. And it just really makes you think, okay, why am I doing this? And who am I trying to please? And so if you're trying to please the wrong people, you're always going to be left empty and void. And so I think walking through such challenging times as a family and just so much pain and brokenness that we endured, um, it's not easy. Like it, it really, um, is so hard being in a public place. You just want to fade into the background and not to be known in that time. Mm -hmm. But I think like looking at it in a bigger picture, God knows why he allows that. And I think that my parents, again, did such a good job of pointing us to Jesus, even through the pain and through the hardship mm -hmm. and like helping us not to just run and like want to isolate forever, mm -hmm. you know, cause like that can be a reaction. Um, but just to trust in, um, what God's doing and then also to continue to just, um, love Jesus and to run to him when things are hard. WeHeartNutrition.com is a family-owned, American-based company that creates wholesome supplements for your body at any stage of life. I love WeHeartNutrition.com because they're using the highest quality ingredients that are research-backed that are in their most bio-available form. That means they're most easily absorbed by your body. I also love that WeHeartNutrition.com designs their vitamin packages specifically for where you are in your life or your health journey. So they have packages to help you achieve fertility so that you can conceive. They have packages for when you do conceive and it's a great prenatal. They have a great package that I have right now for when you're postnatal after you've just had a baby to resupply all the nutrients in your body, the vitamins, the minerals. They also have packages that are premenopausal and postmenopausal. And they of course have your standard everyday vitamin for the every woman. Check out reheartnutrition.com, order a bundle of vitamins directly to your door and get the supplements that are best designed for your health. Go to weheartnutrition.com and don't forget to use the code Lila at checkout for a full 20% off your order. That's Lila at checkout for 20% off your order. One last thing I have to share that I love about We Heart Nutrition is that this is a company that is pro-life and pro-family and a company that donates a full 10% of the sale back to the Pregnancy Resource Center movement. So your money is going to help moms and babies in need, and you're getting an amazing vitamin and supplement. So go to weheartnutrition.com, put in your order, use the code Lila at checkout for 20% off your order. You have your own kids now, mm -hmm. um, and we're going to get into the book, but this is such a, I think it's beautiful. I get to watch from a distance about how you're living your family life now and all the choices you're making to love your kids and your family, and then you're still sharing, you know, you have a public ministry through obviously your book and speaking out on different matters. We're going to get into some of those details about the book, but I am curious how the decisions you're making about your own kids. Yeah. Because you, I think, you know, you, you have so far not done reality TV mm -hmm. at this time with your kids. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're getting those offers and you, you, those opportunities. How are you approaching decision-making about what to share, what not to share yeah. the level of exposure? Yeah. It's so hard. I think, even, you know, like when you have kids, like it mm -hmm. changes how you view life and everything around you. And so, um, for us, Jeremy and I talked about it a lot and it was one of the main conversations we had before we even decided to have kids mm -hmm. 
was how are we going to handle this being in the public eye? And the show was still going on when we had Felicity and she was born um, on the show in a way. Like I was very uh, guarded about how much I let them put on because I think that at that time I didn't have as much freedom to choose. And so um, it was more of like, a thing where I realized, okay, this is what I, this is what I'm required to do is to give some footage. So we just took our own footage, um, of the birth of the birth that we felt comfortable with. And, um, that was what was aired for Felicity. And then, um, later on, like they filmed all of her up until she was like maybe two and a half. And then, um, I was pregnant with, uh, I had another pregnancy actually in between the girls. I miscarried that, mm -hmm. that little one. So and that sorry. was also something that was aired. But then after that, when I had Evie, um, her show was, the show was never aired. They ended up filming some, mm -hmm. but then it was never aired because um, the show was canceled at that point. Mm -hmm. And so um, it was something that we were actually kind of grateful for just to see like, okay, we didn't want our kids in the public eye. And that was something we had decided we didn't want to do. And so we were actually very grateful that that chapter of our lives had mm -hmm. come to a close, even though it was very hard. And it was all very fast too. Mm -hmm. I think that was the other thing because when you have people in your house three to five days a week, and that was like when, before I was married, right? Like at my parents' house, mm -hmm. it was like we would film that many days. The crew was always there. And they were like family to us. And so one of the producers, he started out as a cameraman. So he was there the entire time with us. And other ones were there like 12, 15 years. And so having those people there, that was the hardest part to like break with and to like have to say goodbye to them. Because but you, you didn't get to say goodbye. They were like family to you. Yeah. They, were, they had been there through everything. And I feel like they understood more than anybody else, even your closest friends around you they understood your life. And so the hardest part was just like realizing, okay, we're not going to get to see them every week. And so I think like when something you have like a career or something's like kind of ripped mm -hmm. out from underneath your feet, it's like, I trusted God. And I was so excited for that next season and what the Lord was going to open up for us. Um, but it also was a jolt mm. because it was all I had ever known. And um, it was just a huge transition for us. How did how does how you were raised and your experiences with media, being on TV and now social media impact the choices you're making about your own kids? Yeah, I think initially it started out really, really good and positive. I think the older you get, um, it's harder because there are more relationships to juggle and family and business come together and it, it is difficult. And so I think that for our kids, we've chosen to like keep their lives very private and not show their faces on social media. Try not to talk a lot about them. Like even on, we have a podcast now, but I've like try to talk more about just our lives and things that are happening or mention our kids and stuff. So we'll mention their names, but um, not talking about every detail of their mm -hmm. life and just trying to give them as much privacy mm -hmm. as we can. Cause there are details that um, I think the older you get, you realize like, okay, maybe some things shouldn't be shared. And I don't have any, like, I'm not looking back at those years of filming and having regret, like thinking, oh man, I so wish I wasn't on TV. Cause I also see how God mm. had orchestrated that and used it. And he's still using it today, even though it was hard. And there are days where, yes, you might wish that, that you could just fade into the background. Mm. But at the same time, I think for our kids, there's like, it's a juggling act because social media is still blowing up. We're all as parents realizing like if you have 10 followers or 10,000 followers, you're still realizing like this is just evolving. We don't know the effects of this, kids having phones, all of these things that are around us. And so we've just chosen to protect our kids um, and give them privacy at this point. And then in the future, um, I don't know where that will lead. I don't see us having a reality show again. That's not something that we're like desiring. Um, but yeah, you never know. I think we want to hold everything with an open hand and say, as for now, where we are, mm -hmm. this is our decision as a family and what we think is best for our kids. And then as they grow older and have their own opinions, like we're open to like mm -hmm. hearing what they have to say and seeing what they want to do and exploring that. I think there is a distinction between making the kids the main character 
in what's shared publicly via social media or reality or whatever versus occasionally they're included, but in a way that's still protective of them. And I think a lot of people are wrestling with that. I know mm -hmm. like influencers who, you know, had previously maybe had included their kids a lot in their content who are now saying, I don't want to keep doing it. Yeah. Maybe when they're a baby, they're a little mm -hmm. bitty baby, but now they're in these sensitive tender years where protection is even more important. Mm -hmm. And there's this push against a reaction against it. Yeah. Because we're realizing it comes with these certain consequences and mm. risks that some people maybe didn't even realize before. Yeah, for sure. I think so. I, I definitely think that will affect a lot of parents mm -hmm. and their decisions moving forward. And that's that's where it started for us too. Yeah. And as soon as I got on social media, I was older when I got mm -hmm. on Instagram, but still just seeing all of the negativity mm -hmm. that comes there. And um, there's also a lot of good that can come from that. And so, like I said earlier, it's like, the why behind it. Why are we sharing this? And who are we trying to please? And what do I want to get back from this? So when I want to share, I'll share something on there. And then other times we'll, we'll keep some things mm -hmm. private and we, we won't share every single detail of our kids' lives, um, with the world. Yeah. So when, what inspired you to write Becoming Free Indeed? Well, that was a long process really for me to get to the place where I was ready to write this book was hard because it had been years of me working through and processing the journey coming out of the harmful teachings of Bill Gothard and coming into freedom myself in Christ and not abandoning everything that I had learned in my faith. But the challenge was I saw people all around me who were just totally abandoning everything. They were running to the world, looking for answers there. Meaning that had grown up in the Bill Gothard that had grown up ecosystem. Under, yes, yeah. totally. And, and they so, just totally rejected everything. Yes, everything. Like a ton of my friends were just running away from that system. So and confused. really quick, for, for, for those that don't know the name Bill Gothard, mm -hmm. I think, because we were both homeschooled. So I knew, and we were both, I think, raised evangelical. So mm -hmm. I, I, I was adjacent to that world, I think, because mm -hmm. I knew people like a, from a distance involved, but I yeah. wasn't directly involved. Mm -hmm. And I know some of our listeners may have heard the name, but just for folks clarity, who is Bill Gothard? Yeah. So Bill Gothard, he was somebody who came on the scene in the sixties and seventies, mm seventies. -hmm. He was promising a guarantee for families. He said, mm -hmm. if you follow my seven basic life principles, then your life will be a success. And all you have to do is to like, listen to these lectures. He had 60 plus mm -hmm. hours of basic seminar that you could listen to. And he said, if you do this, you're going to be a light to the nations. You're going to have the perfect family. They're all going to turn out well. You're going to be protected from, uh, your kids will be protected from the sexual revolution that's happening all around mm -hmm. them. And they will grow up to um, be mighty in spirit and to, like I said, lead nations. Mm -hmm. And so that was his promise and guarantee. And so a lot of parents in that time were freaking out mm -hmm. because they were looking at the world around them. The rebellion of kids was mm -hmm. so bad. And they just said, we need an answer. Mm -hmm. So it was crazy because Bill Gothard at that time, he started filling up massive stadiums. So he had mm -hmm. thousands of people who would come. They would fill up these stadiums and he would teach them his basic life principle seminars. And... Um, it was wild because I feel like even some, you know, like decently well-rounded good churches would go there. They would send their people there because initially the teaching started out where it had some good things. He had like a lot of good things to say. It and reasonable it to a lot of people. It seemed so reasonable. Yeah. And so they would like get hooked in his teachings, but then he very quickly started to add more teachings to where he would bind your conscience to something. So he'd say, I want you to make a vow before God that you will read your Bible for five minutes every day. Or I want you to um, make a vow to like a single service commitment to where you're not going to get married for so many years, whatever you feel the Lord lays on your heart. What so, happens if you accidentally break the vow of reading right. the Bible? Well, that's the thing. Because you're not supposed to, I mean, no. even the Bible says like, get, let your yes, yes be yes and your no be no. Yeah. And it's scary. What if you get sick and totally. you know, like, I mean, that, would that mess with people, people's yes, heads? It would. Yeah. And that's, that's the whole premise mm -hmm. of the teachings. They were all based in fear. And mm -hmm. so for me, as a young girl, I went to his seminar at the age of 12, you could go. And so I went there and I made this commitment and it was something that terrified me because immediately he said, after he made the commitment, he's like, don't you, you know, forget to pay this vow that you made to God. If you do, he's like, it would have been better for you to like not hear these teachings and to hear them and depart from them. 
And so it kind of like gripped you in fear. And then he would tell these stories about people who um, basically like it was superstitious stories about how, you know, like objects could cause people to like um, die. And like if, if, if you had a picture of a painting on your wall, this is one story he told. There was a woman who bought a ship painting. She hung it on her wall while her husband and three sons ended up dying at sea. So this pastor comes over, talks to her, and he's like, why do you think they died? And Bill Gothard is recounting the story. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I don't know. I'm like so heartbroken. And he said, it's the picture on your wall of the ship. And she's like, I didn't know. I didn't know that's what caused them to die. So like immediately take it out. And it's like, at what point do you think that that's actually helping people? But he would connect like superstition to things. And so he would have you make vows, but then he would say, if you Meaning have this, like superstition can be good. He it's was like, saying? he would say, it's like, that's, what's going to cause. So a very simple cause and effect sequence. That's how we live our lives is by cause and effect sequences. And so, um, whether it was a cabbage patch doll that you happen to have in your house that could bring in evil spirits. Um, there were times where it was like, you know, just little things that he would come up with and he would say, now this is the new mm-hmm. rule basically. And so you need to follow this. And if you don't, then you're going to bring damnation upon yourself. And it was a really scary way to live because once you make a vow to God, like then you do want to keep that. Mm. But it's just the way that it was done was not right. And it was in fear. And so that was, he was very comfortable placing burdens upon people that they couldn't carry um, and they couldn't fulfill. And I think that that was something that for many years, I, even as like, I was, became a born again believer at the age of 14 and my life really changed. I wanted to love God. I wanted to obey him. But the thing that was hard for me was once I was a believer, I was like, okay, I really, I know all these rules. Like I know all that Bill Gothard wants me to do. And I would look at his teachings as the word of God. So then I like went more hardcore into it because I thought this is the way that I'm going to please God instead of just going. What did that look like to go more hardcore? Into yeah. So just teachings. like abiding by his dress code standards. Mm-hmm. So, um, I have journal entries and I put a couple of these in the book, but some I didn't, but there was one time I was like, Oh, I'm so convicted about my modesty. Cause my skirt is maybe when I sit down, it's not the right length below my knee. And it needs to be, you know, so many inches. And like, I don't want to, you know, like I couldn't buy a sleeveless shirt, but I could roll my sleeves up in the sun. So like there are all these legalistic rules that he would put on you of things you can and can't do. So I basically just leaned heavily into that, like no drums and music, because then you're going to call demons. And so I was very careful. If I ever heard, you know, somebody turn on music with drums, I was just so afraid and I wanted to get away from it. And so I was like a rule follower to the max and just wanted to do what was right before God. But sadly, I was just following this man's teachings instead of realizing, wait, that's not what the Bible even says. Like Mm -hmm. I need to read it for myself Mm -hmm. and to disentangle um, the truth from the error and see what God's word actually says. At what point did you have this awakening of, okay, these rules are in the excess. I mean, we could call them fundamentalist, right? Yeah. Um, where you saw, whether it's the dress code of the skirt to a certain, like long, long skirt, nothing sleeveless, mm-hmm. or it has to do even with the, the teachings on sex. And I want to get into that mm-hmm. in a minute because I see, you know, we recently did a series at Live Action called The Truth About Sex, mm-hmm. where we criticize obviously the sexual revolution, which mm-hmm. is insanity, but then some of the reactions to mm-hmm. it which can be an excess. And that would be some of the excesses of purity culture. Mm -hmm. So, but I want to start with um, your kind of awakening. Like what, at what point did you start to realize this is, this Mm -hmm. is not what God is asking of me. This is something that Bill Gothard is asking of me. Yeah. It actually took me so many years. Um, It wasn't until I met my now husband, Jeremy, where I feel like I was able to actually question for the first time these teachings. And it kind of started out like in a trickle a little bit. Um, my brother-in-law married into the family and he had a little bit of different like theology than us. And so he basically like at their church, they would teach verse by verse through the Bible. So they were like, not just taking a topic and then Mm. teaching on it and making the Bible say whatever they wanted to say. So it was like helpful. He was handling the word of God in a very different way. So 
seeing that, it actually challenged me to read the Bible differently. So I started to see things in the Bible where I was like, okay, I didn't see that before, but it wasn't until Jeremy and I um, started talking. Um, it was- so when you were dating. We were no. dating. We were technically courting in okay. our setting. So it was like, we had to go through a very formal courtship process. Um, Jeremy talked to my dad for five and a half months before we could talk. Wow. Um, just about theology and he had to have his How did you even approval. meet Jeremy? So I met Jeremy through my brother-in-law, that same brother-in-law mm-hmm. I was talking about, Ben. Um, he introduced us and it was really cool because uh, he was like, yeah, there's this guy. He's like pastoring a small church um, on the border of Mexico. And I was like, oh, that's cool. You know? So we ended up meeting him. Um, he actually stopped in at a Bill Gothard conference that my family was at in it's Texas. Like, I'm going to go collect my wife from Crazy. <laughs> he didn't know anything he did, about oh, it. He didn't know what he so was getting into. So he had no clue. Yeah. So he showed up at this conference and he was like, wow, everybody kind of looks the same. Like, okay, but they're all really extra nice. Like everybody has this certain um, vibe about them, like massive smiles, like constant, um, like they're all rejoicing. They're all happy, like all the time. And he's like, wow, this is interesting. Um, but and a lot of that was there. sincere, right? Uh, a no? lot of it. It Maybe depends not. on from person to okay, person. It's really hard to know. Some but it people was, not. I yes. Think. I think a lot of it mm-hmm. can be genuine, but Bill Gothard also was very good about telling us how we need to react. We need to have a perfect greeting And we need Mm -hmm. to always be rejoicing. And a lot of that is in scripture, right? Like rejoice always. But there's also a side of it where it becomes not real because you can't have real conversations with people. Because it's like, are you just putting on a front? Because you're always rejoicing. And And you have to be able to mourn when you need to mourn and be, you know, grieved when you need to be grieved. I mean, that's also very part of the life of Jesus Christ and it's scriptural. For sure. That's exactly Mm -hmm. right. And I think that that was kind of, it felt like it was missing at times. So anyhow, he walks into this world and he meets my family and we ended up meeting that day, what was but that it wasn't like? until I saw him and I was like, okay, he's like, he's good looking and stuff, but he is, um, he was older than me by, he's like six and a half years older than me. So I was like, okay, he's not going to be interested in me. I had other siblings and stuff like that. So I was like, surely, um, he's not interested in me. So I just kind of left it at that. And it wasn't until about maybe like five or six months later where my brother-in-law Ben sent him a video. We were talking about like witnessing and sharing the gospel with people. And I did a little video with my brother-in-law. And so like he had shared that with Jeremy and then they were, he was like, yeah, what do you think about ginger or whatever? And kind of threw that out there. And so um, Jeremy ended up like having interest. And so he signed up for a missions trip. We would go on every year to El Salvador as a family Um, We would go to El Salvador and Honduras for like two to three weeks. And so he just signed up super last minute for that on a mission to get to know me because he knew it would be away from like the crew was not going to follow us that time. And so it would be more of like a time where we could just talk and he could get to know me a little bit. Um, And so that's what happened on that trip. He ended up asking my dad if he could like get to know me better um, and my dad's like, oh yeah, that's, that's fine. He said, maybe we'll talk to each other for a couple of weeks and then you can talk to Ginger after that. Um, and then ended up those couple of weeks turned into five and a half months. And so by the time my dad and mom, like they gave their approval, um, then we started talking. How old were you? I was 22. So do you, like even that, do you think that that, I mean, there's beauty in parents caring so much Yeah, because some parents sure. don't care enough, yeah. right? So obviously there's can be extremes on both mm-hmm. sides, but like, how do you, how do you see that looking back on that now? Yeah. Looking back, I think there were- Would you do that with your daughters, I guess would be- You know, it's question. interesting looking at the girls now. I'm like, I feel like daughters are different. Like mm-hmm. it's harder- I, it would be harder to like let go yeah. at some point. And, and I don't have vet, any boys. It's good to but vet the guy. I mean, yeah, I think there's a lot and of I value think, in that. I think a lot of it too also yeah. was because we were in the public eye. And so That's fair, we yeah. had like, I mean, 25 letters come in and it's like, okay, you don't know these guys from Adam. Mm-hmm. Jeremy was an outsider. He was not somebody that we really knew. My brother-in-law knew him, but only for like, you know, five to six months. And so- Anytime that somebody would come in that you didn't know, it's a longer process because you're like, why are you here? Um, Jeremy hadn't watched the show. Like he hadn't really watched it. He lived at a family's house who like would turn it on and he'd be like, oh, that's so weird. Like, you know, he kind of like almost make fun Mm -hmm. of it at times, Mm -hmm. but um, it was just because it was so different from his Mm -hmm. world. And so when he met me, he wasn't even thinking about that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, he actually came in one of the hardest seasons of our lives. Mm. Um, when we were walking through the most painful time we've walked through publicly, that's when he showed up. Wow. So it really was like, he came in in the midst of that. And I thought like, okay, if a guy can see that and the hardship that we're walking through and not be turned off by that and also respect to my mm. dad and what he had put out for him to do, I was like, he is the real deal. Like he has a heart of gold. I could see, I knew he loved God. I knew he loved his word. He was serving um, in a very not easy place to serve. Mm. Um, and it was sweet to see his heart just in so many ways through that. So that process was not, it, I think there were a lot of things that, yes, we probably would have changed mm -hmm. um, once we were talking. I think there were like a lot of rules that were placed upon couples. Mm. Um, when you needed to have a conversation alone, it was impossible. So like, okay, I'll call you at night. Like we'll talk on the phone. Um, and so I think that some of that was imbalanced, but for the most part, I think that because we were in such a public place, mm -hmm. some of it was needful. It worked. Yeah. yeah. I need to tell you about my favorite coffee company, Seven Weeks Coffee. Seven Weeks Coffee works directly with farmers using fair trade so that they can support farmers who are doing an amazing job growing the best beans in the world. All of Seven Weeks Coffee comes from the highest quality, one to 2% of all the coffee beans that are harvested. Seven Weeks Coffee is small batch roasted, low acid, and organic. You're going to love these coffee blends. They're some of my favorite. I love Ethiopia Medium. You can go on sevenweekscoffee.com and look at their light roast, their dark roast, their medium roast. You're going to find your favorite blend. But my favorite thing about Seven Weeks Coffee, besides a delicious cup of coffee, is that 10% of all of the revenue of the company, not just the profits, 10% of Seven Weeks Coffee revenue goes directly to support the pro-life movement. 10% of all their sales go to pregnancy resource centers to provide material free help to moms and babies in need. So when you go to sevenweekscoffee.com, you join their subscription where you get your monthly subscription of coffee, you know that 10% of all of that sale is going directly to support moms and babies in need. Plus you're getting an amazing and delicious cup of coffee through sevenweekscoffee.com. So go to sevenweekscoffee.com today, Use the code Lila at checkout. You, if you do that and you sign up for the Heartbeat Club, you will become a monthly member and you will get up to 25% off your first order and know that part of what you're doing when you drink your coffee every morning is supporting moms and babies in need. In fact, Seven Weeks Coffee has almost hit their milestone of donating over half of a million dollars to pregnancy resource centers, and you helped make that happen. So thank you and continue to support sevenweekscoffee.com and drink this delicious coffee by going there today and ordering your next coffee bundle. Go to sevenweekscoffee.com today, use the code Lila at checkout, and enjoy your delicious coffee. So he came during that season. So you mentioned the hard times a couple of times and obviously folks watching, some of them may be mm -hmm. familiar with your book already and your whole story. Mm -hmm. But for those that weren't, who aren't yet, if you're willing, can you share mm -hmm. what was that hard time? Yeah, I can talk about it. I will probably get emotional because okay. it's hard um, mm -hmm. to still talk about to this day. But um, yeah, the hard season uh, was when my brother was found out to be living a lie, a double life. And it just really, it was so hard for all of us to walk through that publicly and to see how, how much brokenness and pain is, it caused his family, his kids mm -hmm. and all, um, and all of us who had to deal with that. Um, and set aside the public stuff that doesn't even matter when you're in that place. You just you just realize like, yeah, it can, it can make everything seem a little harder in the moment. Mm -hmm. But at that point, you're just thinking, man, like it just shakes you because this person you thought you knew you didn't know. And so, um, I think that with that, we move forward as a family and began to heal. And then there was another round of, of that again, that was worse. And so I was think- Was that totally like the, cause I remember, I mean, I met um, the, your brother at this one mm -hmm. point, you know, when I was living in DC and he was getting involved in politics. Mm -hmm. And so you obviously, when you meet someone, you may have initial thoughts or feelings, just like quick mm -hmm. snapshot, but yeah. did you, were, was the family surprised, very surprised when that second wave of mm -hmm. uh, truth came out about him or was it more like there was not yeah, as much surprise? I think, 
I think when the second round came out, it wasn't as surprising. I think some, some may have been caught off guard. Um, but a lot of us, I think had our guard up Mm -hmm. and we were not as trusting anymore. And I think that, um, at that point, when you walk through something like that, you have to just, you almost protect yourself emotionally. And so I think that that's kind of where a lot of us probably were. Um, and it was hard. It was a very difficult season. And through it all, like I said earlier, I think I realized God uses all of those things to humble us, to keep us on our face before him, because we could not be arrogant and proud and think that, you know, our family has it all together. We have it all together. We all have to be dependent on God every day to keep us from sin, from walking in a way that's not pleasing to him, um, from, you know, bringing a blot against his name publicly. And so that's something that is like a burned in reminder for us now. And moving forward, it just makes you think like you cannot, you cannot handle sin lightly Mm -hmm. and it's not okay. And I think that that's the lessons that we walk away from now and see God uses all of that, um, the pain, the trials to like help other people who are in that place and to be able to like reach out to them and minister to them. Um, and it's not something that we ever would have wanted, um, but we're, you know, still in a place where it's painful mm-hmm. and hard because it will never be easy whenever one of your siblings has chosen um, that path because you want them to be in a place that's right before God and to not hurt other people. And I think that that's something that um, will will be difficult for a very long time. One of the things that we've, I mean, I know Live Action has done a lot of work on and then I'm passionate about is obviously sexual abuse and mm-hmm. uh, exposing it, covering the cover up of it is part of the problem with mm-hmm. it because unfortunately, and this exists in the Catholic church. I mean, yes. there's some horrible um, scandals in, especially in the nineties, but mm-hmm. you know, the scandal of covering up the sexual abuse of mm-hmm. a, of a priest, you know, mm-hmm. someone who's in a position of spiritual authority, who's yeah. doing evil things. It happens in the evangelical mm-hmm. world. It's something that, I mean, our fallen human nature, this can happen, but then the additional problem is when it happens and then it, there's not justice, Yeah, right? And there's not sure. accountability and protection of the victims. Mm-hmm. I don't know if there's anything you want to share about just your perspective on mm-hmm. even just the, the sin, not just of sexual abuse, but the sin also mm-hmm. of cover up or the fallout from it and yeah. how that's dealt with, or just having gone through all the things you've gone through, you know, your perspective on mm-hmm. how to best protect victims yeah. and make yeah. sure there's protection for future potential victims. Mm-hmm. Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. I think that having walked through a lot of painful things, um, and around that, like it, it is sad to see how many times things are just covered up and, not taken care of and dealt with. And I think Bill Gothard did that too. There was so many things that happened, um, the allegations against him, there was a lawsuit and it was all just like, no, that's not right. It's not accurate. You know, a lot of denial. Um, there was cover up with his brother, things like that, that are happening within these settings. That's with, you know, a cult like thing. But then when you move to the church, it's the same. Sadly, there are so many places where I think you're not exempt when you're in a setting that it's so easy for people to put on a face of wanting to be something and wanting to be in leadership or wanting to um, deal with the vulnerable. And that is such a great place if you have a good heart and you genuinely want to serve people, but then also can be dangerous on the flip side because you can see that um, taking advantage of the weak and the vulnerable who come to a place for refuge, like a church, then that's even more um, difficult. And it's Mm -hmm. traumatic for somebody if they come to that place for help and then they're harmed there. Um, And I think that Mm -hmm. that's something that we do see, sadly, that will come up time and time again. And those people will stand before God ultimately with like such great judgment, because if you are taking advantage of the widow, the father, mm-hmm. fatherless, the orphan, those who come and need refuge, then the you child. are going to be, yes, mm-hmm. you're going to be judged so much greater. And so I think that that is something that is like in the brokenness of this world, we can look around and see the pain, the suffering, all the things that are going wrong, but we know in the end, ultimately that God will win and truth mm-hmm. will prevail. And so there have been so many times where you see something and you're like, oh, like if only 
this could be taken care of now because the pain is so real. The hurt is so real and we want to protect the vulnerable. We're doing all we can to do that. And sometimes justice in this world won't be served as Mm. we wish it would be. And that's something that's hard to reckon with. It's hard to just know how to handle it. But I think that ultimately like looking to our future hope we do all we can. We need to fight against that. We need to expose sin. We need to speak up when something's mm-hmm. not right. Um, we need to be bold. And then at the end of the day, once all of that has gone through the proper means, then it's like we know that this world is broken and it can't all be fixed now. Um, and it's a hard reality, but it's also comforting knowing that um God is not just letting these things happen and looking the other way, but there will be justice served in the end. And it's like a difficult reminder, um, but it's also like comforting at the same time. I think in the, um, this happened obviously in the Catholic in multiple dioceses. And then I've seen it and heard of it happening obviously in the evangelical world and it can happen in any institution, Mm -hmm. but this desire to cover up, to protect a status or to protect image or to protect any number Mm -hmm. of things. And then also like, you know, well, it's, he said, she said, you know, this kind of, Mm -hmm. uh, eagerness to disbelieve the victim Mm -hmm. because the victim is inconvenient. Yeah. And so you know, but I do think that there's some progress being made, the mm. more people speak up, yes. you know, I think your testimony is so powerful. And the more people, you know, the more evil is exposed because mm-hmm. people realize we can't just cover things up anymore. Mm-hmm. How do you think, how is your family doing after all of, all of the fallout? Mm-hmm. Cause I know it's extensive and it obviously affects you, but it affects mm-hmm. everyone. Yeah, for sure. It's hard for me to be able to say, I don't want to speak for my mm-hmm. family, but just looking at um, how they're doing today. I think that they're all just trying to do the best they can Mm -hmm. to heal and move forward. And, um, like I said, that pain will still be there. I think for all of us, um, it'll be there forever probably. Mm -hmm. But I think that, um, ultimately looking at how the family is doing, I think that they're handling everything as well as they can. What's the, what kind of impact back to your kind of the the thread of disentangling, I think Mm -hmm. is the word you use Mm -hmm. from the fundamentalism and discovering freedom in Christ. You write about the Gothard's teaching on sex Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of emphasis in Gothard's teaching on sex. My understanding Mm -hmm. is on, it's kind of a one-way street, Mm -hmm. sexual satisfaction. So really focus on, you need to be sexually available, ready, Mm -hmm. you know, just this soft place to land for Mm -hmm. the husband. And the wife's job is to bring life into the world Mm -hmm. and kind of be in the home. And if you're not, you know, in shape, beautiful, Mm -hmm. have a well-managed home, always sexually available no matter what, then it's your fault Mm -hmm. if your husband uh, makes a mistake or is unfaithful, quite frankly. And that's a particularly damaging Mm -hmm. teaching to a whole generation Mm -hmm. of women as a reaction to the sexual revolution, because I think it's focusing instead on a man's sexual passions Mm -hmm. as again, somehow being, it's okay for the man's sexual passions to be uninhibited in a marriage. Right. Right. It's like, take, Mm -hmm. take lustful passion and just channel it through marriage. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that is it's the objectification then of the wife, as opposed to mutual self gift between Mm -hmm. the spouses. I I love one of the reasons I I fell in love with the Catholic teaching is that it's all about self mutual self gift. Mm -hmm. And it's not just woman submits to man, but it's a mutual self gift in Mm -hmm. sex, in life and love. And you're required to be chased in inside and outside of marriage. Mm -hmm. It's not just you go to marriage and you do whatever you want. How did, how did your experience, what your family went through, and then even your relationship meeting and falling in love with your husband, Mm -hmm. how did that impact your views on sex? Yeah. I think that within Bill Gothard's setting, like you said, it was very warped view. I think that it was, um, very oppressive towards women. And Mm -hmm. like you said, we're in like, my view now is not one of, okay, I'm going to be this woman. I'm going to be this strong leader. I'm like, do everything that a man does just because I can. Like, I'm not in that place. You're not, a, you're not the not kind a of feminist fringe like feminist that. of I'm so, going to do whatever yes, I want. Yes, but at the yeah. same time, I think that there was such a warped view in Bill Gothard's mm-hmm. setting where it was like, exactly like you said, the woman has to perform. She has to always be ready. She has to always be available and look gorgeous, which is just hard to do sometimes. And I think that that put a lot of pressure on women and- 
in that setting, I feel like it really made it tough for them to feel like they were able to like enjoy the marriage and relax. I can't speak for everyone, but I, I would say that you could see women who were having um, so many kids, which I don't have a problem with that. Like, I think that there are different convictions on that within the church and those who will, you know, look at, look at the number of kids that you have as, you know, like we are, you can do natural family planning or you can't, you know? And I think that a lot of those things are debated amongst Christians, but I think that within this setting of Bill Gothard, it really was hard for women because they felt like all they were doing was just being trying to like keep up, trying to Meaning look they had a certain to have, way. They had to have a lot of children. If they yeah. were, what if they weren't able to have? Yeah, children? and if they weren't able to have kids, or that's they the were other not able thing. to have as many yeah. as what seemed to be the standard. Yeah, that's the other thing that it would just make you feel less than because what am I supposed to do now? Cause I can't work outside the home. So you were prohibited and from working outside the home. So if you're a woman, you weren't really supposed to work outside the home unless you were working for your dad. And it was kind of like a thing or Bill Gothard, unless you're working for Bill Gothard <laughs> you could, and you could be 15 and working for Bill Gothard. Bill Gothard knew that women yeah. make great workers, yes. but they can only work for him. Yes. It's just very for him. Convenient. So yeah. it is convenient. But 15 year old girls yeah. working for him. Yeah. And he that's where some of the allegations girls. against his whole crew came in mm -hmm. because there was the objectification and even sexualization yes. of girls working for him. Yes, for sure. And it really was a challenge. And I think once I saw that, like, and, and stepped outside of that world, looking back into it, I thought, how would I ever think it was good for these 15, 16 year old girls? who would say, I'm going to give you something better than an education. Come work at my headquarters. And they would go work for him. And I just like, it wasn't like they were always working alone with him, but Still, what would like, they be doing? What kind of jobs? They were like working in the mailroom, um, mm -hmm. or they were traveling to other countries, you know, presenting character mm -hmm. cur curriculum in schools or whatever it was that he had these different mm -hmm. jobs for them to do, or leading girls' trips whenever people would come to his headquarters. Then they would be the leaders. And it was always the girls who were like the models. They were so mm -hmm. pretty. We would always say, like, if they were blonde, we'd be like, oh, that's a Gothard girl, or like, um, we put on a wig once and like at a store, I feel like it's Claire's, they have those like long blonde wigs. So like we put it on and we're like, oh, now we could be a Gothard girl, not even thinking of what that meant. Mm. And we were so young and it was like an honor if you got asked to go work for him. And I think some parents, I had, you know, friends where their parents were like, no, you're going to go to college. You're going to actually like stay at home. You're going to finish your high school. Um, and then you're going to like go on and like get it, get an education. Um, but a lot of them were so, they felt so indebted to Bill Gothard for these teachings that they would send their kids there to work for him. And so I think that the, the view of sex and the view of the women's roles were so messed up that when I got married, I was very passive and Jeremy really had to pull and work on me in a way like, no, I want to hear your, I want to hear what you have to say. But I was mm -hmm. so afraid of even telling my opinion. Like if you would say, okay, where do you want to go for dinner? I could have told him. It wasn't a sin for me to tell him like, Hey, I want, I want steak tonight or let's do tacos, you know, like, but I was so like, whatever you want, babe, whatever you want. Like I was mm -hmm. so in that mindset to where I couldn't even really think for myself. Mm -hmm. And Jeremy noticed that and really, really helped me. He wanted to hear my heart. He wanted to hear what I had to say. If I had an opinion on something, something that he had said that I didn't like, he wants to hear it. And so he really worked and like, it was so sweet because I was afraid to talk to him about things that mattered for so long, but he was so patient with me and still is to this day at times when I like, you'll switch back into that mode. Cause like, you're so afraid, um, because it was like drilled into you. You have to be a certain way or your husband's not going to be pleased with you. And Jeremy has just been like so helpful. It's taken, you know, all of these years working through that. And like, you know, when you're pregnant, it's like, oh, now I don't feel so pretty. But he's like, no, it's like, don't worry about that. Like, you're fine. Like, <laughs> you don't have to perform. You don't have to be a certain way, look a certain way. He's like, I just want to know you for who Ginger actually is. And like, in every stage of life, I'm with you, you know, until like the Lord has us part ways at death. And so it's like that comforting reassurance, knowing that like, I don't have to be a certain, 
way for him. And like, he's so patient and like, we're a team, everything that we do, like whether I'm, um, writing a book or like doing a project, he's helping out, you know, with the kids or like finding somebody to help with them. And like, we're a team. We're not, we're not like, um, he's just at work. And then I, I have to do all the things. It's a joy to be at home. It's a joy to like be able to raise my kids, pour, pour into them and all of those things. I'm not saying that like motherhood is such a gift. And I think that's like often overlooked mm -hmm. in our culture. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time, I'm like looking at what Bill Gothard said, it was supposed to be in those imbalances and just seeing how far, um, how much growth can happen when you have a right perspective of what God has required of you and what he's designed marriage to be as a beautiful gift from God, two people coming together, wanting to glorify God, um, co-laborers mm -hmm. in the gospel and life together, um, laying down our lives for one another as Christ mm -hmm. would the church and the husband and the wife, you know? And I think that, like you said, it's just the beauty of that um, where I had not thought it would be, you know, like I looked at my life when I was like 14 and I thought, okay, I have all the answers for if my kids rebel, I have all I have all the answers from Bill Gothard on what to do. If, you know, I have marriage problem, Put I them know in what long to do. Skirts. <laughs> yes, do it. And turn Not off that the rock we don't music, like long kids. skirts, but yeah. So yeah, seriously, they're very in right now. Yeah. So um, anyhow, with all of that though, I think it's just interesting mm -hmm. because it changes your perspective and it really gives you such a greater view of like what God has designed and the beauty of that. And I know the world every day is trying to distort that. And they can think we're still so old fashioned because we hold to the Bible as the word of God and like mm -hmm. these traditional values that we do as Christians, um, they can still think that we're crazy and that's fine because we were promised that they probably would think that we're crazy, right? Like the world will hate us. But I think that realizing like it, we want to show this beauty of marriage and coming together and, um, and the balances of that and the joys of it as we are designed to be as Christians, serving God, loving God together, it's a joy. Everylife.com is America's fastest growing diaper and wipes company, and it is America's pro-life diaper and wipes company. I love Every Life because the team that created this product had you and your family and your little ones in mind. It's a best-in-class product with great materials that is designed for the comfort and the care of your baby. Everylife.com will deliver diapers and wipes directly to your door, and know that whenever you purchase diapers from Everylife.com, you are helping support the pro-life movement because Everylife.com gives back part of their proceeds directly directly to support pro-life organizations that serve babies and their mothers. So go to everylife.com today, get some diapers and wipes for your little one or for a loved one's little one, and use the code LILA at checkout for 10% off your order. That's everylife.com. And don't forget to use the code LILA at checkout for 10% off your order. I love, I love that. Um, the, the fact that our faith, like the faith of what Jesus actually teaches there is the ability to take it like super, like you say, left wing, like mm -hmm. destroy man and woman as separate genders or, mm -hmm. you know, life is a threat and pregnancy, abort your pregnancy. I mean, there's people, mm -hmm. unfortunately, who profess the name of Jesus who have mm -hmm. these extreme views and false views on sex and on marriage and on life. And then you have a fundamentalist view, the other extreme. Mm -hmm. And I think you grew up with a lot of that, what you're experiencing and you described with Bill Gothard and it's a different form of objectification, mm -hmm. but it's the same, I think, root, misunderstanding the human person and, mm -hmm. and what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a man. But it's just, it is true how beautiful it is when you meet. And also you, it could be a big family. You meet a beautiful family where you see the spouses are loving and serving mm -hmm. each other. They're in it together. Obviously there's a, a level of role when, when you're a mother of young children, you know, mm -hmm. like yeah. you you alone can carry the baby. Yes. We alone can, can nurture, but that there's a shared team spirit with yes, that for sure. And that there's sacrifice inside the marriage mutually mm -hmm. for each other. Mm -hmm. And I just think that view is what the world needs. Mm -hmm. And when people w encounter it, it's so refreshing for them to mm -hmm. get to, to experience it and see it actually being lived out. For sure. Yeah. So what does your, you know, once you kind of had your realization, I mean, you're, you're married now, you're, you wrote this book when you were writing the book, was it did you wrestle with what to share and what not to mm -hmm. share? Was there times where like, this is too personal? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I went back and forth a lot. I really wanted to be sensitive and careful with my words and not share anything that would be hurtful to anyone. And so that was something that, 
I prayed through, I talked to Jeremy about, talked to very close friends and just kind of like bounced things off of people trying to figure out, okay, how much should I share? Is this a helpful piece of, mm. you know, something I should share or should I keep that private? And so mm. just keeping it focused on the theology and the issues that were there, that was my heart. And I wanted to be able to help people who are still stuck in these teachings to be able to come mm. to find freedom in Christ themselves, because I feel like that was my heart. It's not a tell all. It's not like, this is crazy. Look at what I grew up in. And I resent it all. Mm. Like, it's not that. Mm -hmm. I see how so many well-meaning, um, even like awesome Christians got wrapped up in this teaching because mm -hmm. it promised the guarantee for success. Mm -hmm. It's what you want for your kids. It's what you want them to thrive. You want them to love Jesus mm -hmm. and you want them to like be well-rounded citizens. And so I think that's what Bill Gothard had promised. And it makes sense. I look at it and I say, okay, like I get how you can believe that. I'm not saying you're crazy for believing it, but at the same time, it is error and it needs to be exposed as mm -hmm. that. And that was something that took me years to get to the place where I felt like I wasn't people pleasing too much to like mm -hmm. be quiet. Like I, I can be a people pleaser by nature. And so I just want to be quiet. I want to make everybody happy. And for so many years, that's kind of how I lived my life. But then once I realized the negative effects and the people that were being harmed by it and the friends who were totally running away from everything that was in the Bible because they were harmed by this false teaching, it needed to be exposed. And so that's what drove me was not comfort. It was not an easy thing to do, um, but I knew it was necessary. And God gave me the strength and the help to like be able to speak out and write this book. Um, and not everybody was pleased with it, um, but I was thankful that for the most part, the reception was good and it was surprising um and the lord has been using it and i'm very grateful for that but it's i think anytime that we have that like conflict within us of should i do this or should i wait like mm -hmm. you know just taking it before the lord and trusting in him and realizing like okay if people hate me because i write this book then i want to just do what's right before god and i was convicted that the right thing to do was to write this book I think you did a great job of balancing honor. I think there is mm. a lot of honor and respect in your book for the good things because mm. there are so many good things, obviously about mm -hmm. what your parents did and how they mm -hmm. loved you guys, but then sharing the hard things. I think mm -hmm. that takes a lot of balance to be able to do that. What have been some of the responses you've gotten? Have there been other people who have had the, their own mm -hmm. journey and they related to you or what has that been like? Yeah, I've been so, so grateful to hear all the responses that people have sent, um, even from friends who... I wouldn't have expected to reach out to me saying that they really appreciated the book. Some of them still in this, that setting with Bill Gothard and um, others who have been outside of it for years and have wrestled with how to disentangle truth from error. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been so encouraging overall. Like that's what drives you. That's what keeps you going is just realizing like, okay, even if it helps one person, it's worth it. And I've had so many friends and even people outside that I've never met mm -hmm. who have been, um, had the similar story and it's, um, God's used it to just help them as well to come out of those teachings. So yeah, I'm just really thankful for even the difficulties that we go mm -hmm. through. Um, and all of that fear that you experience, you know, it's like, well, God is using it now on the other side, um, to redeem that for good. I think so much. I think even in my own marriage, there's there's this closeness and intimacy where how you relate to your spouse, it's connected to how you relate to God mm. because, you know, the most intimate relationship we have is with God. Mm. And then the most intimate relationship we have, you know, on this earth mm. and in one sense is with our spouse. You mentioned just this beautiful relationship that you, you have with your husband where mm. you just really have this trust and he's mm. taught you it sounds like a deeper, more beautiful intimacy mm -hmm. that maybe you're, you know, stripping away some of that fundamentalism that mm -hmm. you grew up with. Do you see that in your relationship with God? What has yeah, that been like? For sure. Most definitely. I think, yeah, like you said, um, God's used Jeremy in so many ways just to like be there mm -hmm. as such a rock for me. And also like he has pointed me back to God in so many hard seasons. Um, and it's amazing because really whenever your view of God as one is like a taskmaster. Mm -hmm. He's out to get you. He's getting out waiting to smite his children at any turn. That's scary. It's very terrifying because you're just thinking, I don't know what's expected of me. What does God expect of me? Like, 
and you're trying to figure it out all the time mm -hmm. on your own instead of like realizing that God is a kind and loving savior. We will sin every day. There is so much mm -hmm. sin that is still existing because mm -hmm. we're in a fallen, broken world. We're sinners. We've been redeemed, but that does mm -hmm. not mean that we're exempt from sinning. And so I think that that's something that has really been helpful for me to view is like my relationship with God is not dependent upon the amount of good that I'm mm -hmm. doing right now. I want to honor him, but I'm not going to do that perfectly. Mm -hmm. But his grace is going to sustain me and his forgiveness covers my sin. And that's something that it was hard for me to understand for so long. And Jeremy was so, so good to remind me of that. So I feel like today my relationship with God is in such a better place than it ever was because I see him in a different light in more, like I said, the grace filled Christian life, mm -hmm. as opposed to the fear based, um, rule based life. I love the, I think it's Proverbs, but the just man falls seven times, mm -hmm. but that, you know, he gets Rise up again, again. he yeah. rises again. And I, there's a saint that I love, St. Jose Maria Escriva, who says the saint isn't made by, you know, how, how much they're perfect, but that when they fall, they get up again mm. and they choose to trust. They choose yeah. to say, sorry, they choose to trust mm -hmm. again and seek after God again, because that's, that's, so that's the whole life, right? Yes, of, a, of the Christian is yeah. getting up again and trying better mm. and, and because of love. Because yes. it's a love story with yes. God and, and Jesus Christ. He's our he's our mm. first love. You've been very open about your pro-life stance. And I know mm. sometimes in the industry and the entertainment world, that can be really difficult. Mm. I want to change that. Unfortunately, it's difficult. What informs your pro-life stance? Yeah, I think just realizing what God says about life and mm. the value of human life from conception being important. I think that as a Christian, I have no other... Um, way that I could get around that. I know some Christians try to, but I think that life matters to God. And so it matters to me. And so just seeing these precious mm -hmm. babies um, and even inside the womb as something that I want to speak up for, because I mean, my youngest sister, Josie was born at 25 weeks gestation and seeing her at one pound, six ounces, mm -hmm. you can look at her and say, okay, like, how in the world is she going to survive? Like her skin was like almost see-through. And it was incredible seeing that though, because even for the pro-life cause, you look at it and say, wow, like she is so beautifully designed. She's not full term, but even the tiniest baby matters mm -hmm. and that life should not be taken. They should be able to have a voice even inside the womb. Amen. What's, um, what is life going to be like for you in the future? What are you guys... I know you have your podcast, yeah. you have your babies. What does yes. what life look what does life look like in the future for the Voilos? Yeah, it's been an exciting season. Um, a lot of change. We just moved to a new house. It was only 10 minutes away, but it's a project. <laughs> so we're in the middle of remodels, mm -hmm. kitchen remodels. <laughs> um, our kids are growing. Uh, Felicity is in kinder right now. Um, and then it's just like there's so many changes that are happening around um, there are more projects in the works that I'm working on now and, uh, we'll probably announce that soon, but it's just exciting. Like there are so many, so many things that God's doing in our lives, mm -hmm. even together. Like it's just such a fun season. I love being in the stage with our kids, six and three. They're so much fun, so much energy, and it's just such a gift from God. Thanks so much for joining the podcast, Ginger. This has been a joy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the world's leading Catholic network, reaching millions with the truth about the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.